Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us for another OG Rose conversation. Today I have the pleasure of um, talking with um, Javier Rivera and we're very excited to jump into an essay that he wrote called Invisible Work. So um, I just wanted to ask you what kind of prompted you to write that Javier? Well, <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's one of those things that I, I think we mistake what we call work it's often you know, visible work. It's it's always, you know, what I'm doing with my hands, what I'm doing with my time. Um, oftentimes we don't think about what's sort of accumulating in the, in all of our experiences and what everything's going on. And I know that I personally had to deal with kind of like my own self guilt of like, oh, you didn't do anything today. And then I really questioned that. I really said, well, is it true that I'm not really doing anything or is it that I'm just sort of like not remembering or how can I take what seems like not work and to transform that into something? And so I think when I approach this from the level of memory, memory and, and time, I think it really changes the whole perspective of what it means to like work. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I hope everybody goes and reads the essay. They can find it right on your, your Medium page. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, great. So everyone should go to Javier's Medium page. You can also find him on Instagram. Um, he's got a link in bio now, so we can <laughs> go and check it out there. Um, so, yeah, I, I really, it's something that I think, um, to me, I was thinking about as we were approaching uh, talking about this is, you know, it's interesting because the term like work, I think, I think what I see in your essay is actually like a reclaiming of the word work. And, um, you know, a lot of times it's associated simply with the output, the productivity that's visible. And like you're saying, when we think about this approach of uh, what about the invisible work? And I think, you know, I, I know we had been talking about um, actually having time to actually sit down and write things or have a written reflection. And sometimes you just don't, haven't gotten it to it yet. And so you can feel this sort of sense of, um, you know, uh, disappointment in oneself. But at the same time, like you had mentioned, it was it's like, well, everything's actually gathering. A lot of thoughts are coming together, things you don't foresee that you may have an experience that then illuminates that topic once again. Um, and then it's kind of like, it's almost like a cup filling, 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 filling with water. And then there's the overflow, right? And then when that overflow happens, that's when, you know, perhaps there is the visible, the visible out, you know, uh, production or output, if you will. Um, but I was thinking about how that, again, the word work is interesting. And I, I someday I follow a um, philosophically minded person who shared about how work has, he doesn't like to call it like workouts, you know, when you work because he's like, well, you know, work is so, we just think about it like you could only be doing this because it's productive, because it's work. But, you know, he does it because of the, not just the physical benefits, but the emotional, uh, philosophical, the, the idea of like pushing yourself, have, feeling good actually. And so he was kind of discussing this idea too. So I, I was kind of wondering like, what do you think on that? Like, it, you know, his, his idea was, okay, well, we, we call it a workout because it, even our, you know, everything has to be in this orientation of work, you know? Um, but obviously the idea of the invisible work is that it kind of extends the word work. It, like I said, it kind of reclaims, instead of just saying like, we're not gonna use the word work, we're actually just gonna expand it. That's kind of what I got from the essay in a sense. Yeah, it, it basically destroys the concept of leisure <laughs> and, and, and free time, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. sort of, I think, yeah, it, I think it, I mean, I was inspired from it mainly because uh, of Rilke. You know how much I love Rilke. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so Rilke talks about how, in one of his letters, he talks about there's really nothing, there's really nothing but work. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what he truly believes. And when I came across one of his quotes that I, that I put in the essay, now I can't quote it directly, but it had something to deal with, you know, maybe... Uh, maybe creation is just a profound act of mem uh, memory. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so I decided to play with that quote and really dig at what that means. Yeah. You know, what, what, what does that even look like? I mean, he says it, but what does that really mean? Yeah. And so I, I really kind of 
broke it down in my essay and played with time, played with memory. Um, yeah, I, I think I think I think having the ability to extend it because um, we do have the the bad habit of always dividing things into yeah. into sections, right? That this is this is the time for work, this is the time for play, this is the time for this. Um, but I think my my essay was like all those things are forms of work, but work towards what, right? Like we could say, you know, somebody doing carpeting, they're working doing that craft, but does it mean that, you know, when they're watching Netflix that they're not working? And some would argue, yes, they're not working, but at the same time, it just depends on how they're paying attention to uh, the Netflix or someone. Like, cause you could actually do something very creative with the things that you watch in your carpenting or in your, you know, thing. So it just depends. Yeah, it does, it does. And see, it's interesting because your title Invisible Work therefore makes it like, you can't know for somebody else, you certainly couldn't know. You know, it's, it, it's interesting because like even to do invisible work, which is to see the productivity, if you will, of even just getting a cup of coffee or watching something on Netflix is an invisible work itself, right? It's like a shift in your heart and mind to say, I'm going to utilize this and see this as um, part of the bigger picture, part of the, the building. And it's also why it's interesting. I feel like your your essay actually makes it um, like it, it made me feel like, wow, you really can't. I mean, obviously, it's not good to judge. We, we know this, but it's it's even further evidence of that. Right. Because you can't ever see what someone else is doing and, and make the judgment of if they're doing work or not, because they might choose to utilize it for something that they create. Um, they might not. They, so it's really just, you can't know really. And actually like we talked about this a little bit because you also did a great video on invisible work, which is on your YouTube channel. Everyone should go and check out Javier's YouTube channel. He's got a lot of great stuff there. And he did a video reading the essay and then going into some like a rebuttal and it was very good. So please everyone go and check it out. Um, but when we're talking about the couch potato, right? Like this idea of like, well, you know, somebody's going to push back and be like, well, come on now. Like there are times when somebody's not doing work, you know, what about the, the kind of quote unquote lazy person sitting on the sofa and just sort of eating Cheetos and, you know, that's all they're doing. Like, is that really work? Um, but we, we talked with each other about it. And this is why time's so important, which, you know, you bring mm -hmm. up and you talk a lot about, which is why I want, really want people to go and hear all of the things you, you write and, and um, share, because time is a very, I think, I feel like it's something you're really fascinated in and really delve mm -hmm. into. And it's very insightful. So with time though, see, and this relates to something Daniel's written on called flip moments, right? Mm -hmm. 10 years, you could be like a couch potato. Then suddenly you, you, change your, you know, you have some sort of epiphany and something inspires you, something changes for you. And then, you know, now you're actually like wanting to, you know, live again, make things again, you know, engage more so in your life. And it's now it's like you said, you've actually got so much material almost, right? It's, it just suddenly changes it in an instant. It becomes a flip moment to being work, being toward the work of your life in time, but you have to give time, you know, you have to allow for time to manifest that, right? So um, I think it's interesting because you got, have to give yourself like the space to, to allow for that to happen. Now, I'm thinking now even further on this idea though, if somebody really wants to push and it's like, well, what if somebody never, like, how is that concept going to motivate someone to stop being like a couch potato, right? Like someone who's not doing any work because, you know, like, how does that motivate them? I'll say my idea, but I want to hear what you think about that. <laughs> so the way, the way I defined work was the constant accumulation of experiences, right? And so if we take, if we take my definition of work, the way, the way I've laid it down, technically the couch potato is always doing work. He's just not um, yielding from it. He's just not like picking from it, right? It's, it's all there for you to, to have and to, I guess, nourish yourself from, but it's, He's just not remembering that like, you know, it's kind of like, it's like being a farmer and having people work for you. Um, I, I take this as like all the experiences I'm going through every single little thing. It's like, you're a farmer, you have a bunch of people tilling the fields, growing your crops. Now the thing that all you have to do is sort of just acknowledge that these fruits are ripe and ready for you to put into existence, 
right, to sell at the shop, right? That doesn't that doesn't really take that much work. It's just, mm -hmm. just a matter of remembering that these things are there. Um, so it's like when we take it, when we look at it that way, it it makes sense. And actually, in the middle of this conversation, I was just thinking about, I didn't think about this. I was thinking about mental health, right? Um, and how often, like, the very first thing an addict has to do is to admit that they have an addiction. But we're assuming that that, that doesn't take work mentally to get there to admit that, mm -hmm. right? There has to be some kind of internal shift, some kind of, Invisible. you know, yeah, yeah, invisible work <laughs> to really actually believe and sincerely come to the conclusion um, that you actually believe that you, you know, you're a, you're addicted to this, right? That you have a problem, mm -hmm. right? And and then I, I think it's pretty useful because we often we often look at addicts or we blame people. We're like, well, you're not changing. You're not doing anything. You're not. You're not. Um, you know, I don't see you making that visible change right the thing is it's perhaps that there's this uh, invisible struggle going on that you cannot quite see the visible change yet you know so there is this constant struggle but of course it's nothing that nobody can see so when we encounter someone like like this you know we just say well you say all these things but i don't see you doing it um now i think there's a big gap there because there's like it could just be that there's this constant and in, you know inner turmoil uh that's going on that doesn't quite let them get there yet um so i think it, it i think it provides some understanding in that aspect as well i think so too yeah. honestly it reminds me a little bit of um what you're talking about just not that this is like exactly mental health related but I think this is like when I remember some of these ideas percolating to come to the, you know, come to fruition in the, the Invisible Work essay when you actually, when you wrote your um, personal essay. So in that, like, it, I remember discussing this idea of how in a couple of years, you know, so much can change, you know, so much can change, but it doesn't look like on the outside, like, you know, anything really changed at all. But if you look back on your, your life and you see maybe, um, some of the things that you've uh, you allowed yourself to question or, or dig into or like explore, you know, you can be at a completely different place, you know, almost like mentally, even spiritually, um, emotionally. Um, and it, yet it, it doesn't look like you're doing anything different per se. I think we often do in, um, and it's, I mean, you can't blame the human because we are very visual people, right? And that's great. It's so good to be able to see and be visual people. Um, but see, the thing is, even visual comes from something that we can't see. So it, it's um, it's an interesting how we often use the barometer of like, you know, what are you doing now that that's different than five years ago? Or like, you know, how, how are you advancing? And yet we have such little space. We hold so little space for the advancement of the invisible work you know, the advancement, which would be the things really of like, you know, your character changing or your, your mindset changing or, you know, and it's just very, very fascinating because I think this does tie in a bit to, to, well, it does tie into the invisible work because there's so much being done there, but yet you just can't see it. And I think it's easy therefore to not prioritize it, right. Or to yeah. just completely invalidate it. Like, oh, it just doesn't matter. Or what am I doing? Why am I spending my time on this? But yet it's just as much like a construction and a building that as it is to, you know, take bricks and build, you know, build a wall or build, you know, um, some sort of home or something like that. There's place for both and there's space for both. And the thing is that a physical home would have no, I mean, it would be there physically, but it wouldn't really be there um, in a more profound way if, if the invisible work wasn't done, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even think about how we have to lay down the foundations of the home sort of mentally um, before we start actually drawing, you know, actually drawing it out, right? It sort of takes place in the imagination, like, oh, where do you want the kitchen to be? Oh, mm -hmm. like, how do you want the, the bedroom to look like? Okay. And like all these kind of things, like that's, you know, that's work. It's work. And that's why I always kind of put the question, but like working towards what? Um, and that, and that really like triggers the, the kind of memory of like, I'm working towards building a house. So right. that means everything from the moment of the idea is work. Exactly. Um, 
Well, it's just so fascinating, right? Because you literally wouldn't have the particular home that's there without that invisible work. You, you just, you can't, you can't have it. It's just not, and maybe I think maybe the more that, it's funny, you know, you bring up the carpenter, right? <laughs> I always think of carpenters like, you know, measure twice, cut once. There's such an amazing trade and so detail oriented. And it's, there's a lot of planning and, um, you know, unseen stuff that goes into making like a successful table or whatever. Um, but it's, you, you really can't do, I, I guess what I mean to say is like maybe some people who have their hand at a trade like that might actually be more able to understand like the invisible work, oddly enough, because maybe it seems mm. like, well, they're so grounded, they're so tactile that they wouldn't see it. But I feel like sometimes you actually find that these, you know, really insightful people who are just, you know, doing very daily hand practical work. I don't know who says this, but it's like, it's like an artist thing to say, like, you know, the whole point is to make the invisible visible right mm -hmm. yeah. um but the thing is like that requires work um mm -hmm. to make that visible and what i'm saying is that the work is al already there mm -hmm. um yeah. and it actually brings me back to like even having uh, you know this will bring back to mental health again but it's like uh it's like when you're talking to a therapist right yeah. um the therapist is really there just to kind of poke at things that are there inside of you that you didn't realize mm -hmm. right poke at little holes that you didn't think or haven't been paying attention to right people are like oh well you know you suffered this you suffered this kind of trauma and so and so so like you know and, and the therapist always has like this way of just like reframing and reorienting you to such a way that you actually remember um you go oh that's why i act like that oh that's why i'm behaving the way i'm behaving and once you once you do that reframing you start to see the external behavior change, right? And so that's why I like the idea of invisible work because it's like, when I talk about remembering, it's basically like reorienting yourself into such a way that you can see, once you acknowledge it, you, you will be able to see the, the visible work soon enough mm -hmm. um, and that the work was always there. Yeah, and that's the thing. There's, the point is not just to stay in the invisible, right? I mean, it's it's for the greater, it's for, well, I don't know what's just greater. It's like, they're both very important. The invisible and the visible they are in tandem. You can't really, you can't separate them. Um, but I do think we try sometimes in, in, it can be easy to just try to push the vis visual work and never do any of this, which is strange because that's like trying to grow a plant without a root, right? You could, you just can't, you can't do that. <laughs> it's just not going to, it's not going to happen. But you know, it's interesting because it's like, well, you know, I think it's always fascinating on the farm here when, you know, we, we plow a section of land and then it's like, it doesn't look like there's anything there. You haven't even planted anything yet. And then things still come up. All the, you know, if you want to call them weeds or plants, you don't, you're not interested in having there or whatever, but they just start sprouting. There's all these tiny little sprouts and you're like, I didn't even plant anything. Like, how can they all be here? So it's like, it's already there. It makes me think about this idea that the work is already there. Really, it's really more of like a harvesting and a weeding out to see like, what do you want to, to flourish? What, to what ends, right? Like, what's the point? What, to what direction are you going toward with it? And so I do really like this idea of, um, you know, the harvesting and like that, that's when you maybe actually physically do something, but you are still always in a sense doing something because it's still growing, it's still percolating, it's still mm -hmm. advancing forward. So back with the mental health thing really quickly. Um, I wonder if because of its invisible work, I wonder if that's why it can be, like we we're talking about, it can be challenging to prioritize that or, you know, maybe f people feel like, well, I'm doing nothing. Like, what am I doing exactly? Um, but I think, you know, that what I like about your essay is you talk about this idea of remembering and then in your, your um, video, you talk about paying attention, right? Like just giving attention to. So, you know, remembering is, it's really, this is key too, though, because like, like we talked a little bit about even just remembering that you are doing a work in your existence, you know, like the fact that just to be, just to be is already doing a work. Um, and, but it, it's weird. It almost takes work to get into that state of, um, 
of just being right just the fact that just who you are and and the fact that you exist and you breathe air is already already doing the work so it's interesting because it takes like a an in, invisible work of remembering to just allow yourself to be <laughs> absolutely um that's why that's why i threw the, the time in there because yeah. i've hear so many comments about you know like some great intellectual right that they stopped writing for 10 years mm -hmm. and then you know they're like we didn't see any work from him for 10 years um, but the thing is for me it's like all that stuff was just sort of accumulating and then they finally come out with the book right um yes. and, and for me i'm just like but those 10 years must have been so crucial for him so dear to him to to eventually pour out into this one book mm -hmm. um so so yeah it's uh and and i think usually dividing time i mean that's that's the problem i think it's as well um and and again like also the, the direction is very important right the di direction is very important because it could be that i quit my job at starbucks and you know i'm not working but the thing is i'm just not working towards starbucks anymore <laughs> you know i'm but, but the real question is like what am i working towards now yeah. right and once the individual starts asking that question they start realizing like, oh, you know, I quit my job at Starbucks because I really want to work towards another dream that I want or something like that. Um, it really expands work to something else rather than just um, money accumulation and manual labor. It does, definitely does expand it so much. I mean, it doesn't throw out the work of the, physical, the manual labor or the job or whatever or making money, but it, it certainly it amplifies it up and it makes it much more, um, yeah, a broader understanding um, so that we see, we, we don't have to compartmentalize it so much, you know? Because I think if the risk of not amplifying it is that you can fall into this despair of like, oh, I'm not working anymore. Well, no, you, you are still working. It just looks different. <laughs> and then also just, you know, practically speaking, like as a mother, there's so much time where you're spending you know, taking care of the little ones, preparing food, you know, cleaning, cleaning again, <laughs> painting, cleaning the paint, you know, and there's, there's all these act things you're doing that it's, it's all building though. Like, I think it can be, you think to yourself, well, I haven't like folded the laundry yet, or I haven't like, I haven't done these, I don't know, like if I had a chore task, like ch chart, and I can't check those things off just yet. But, you know, all of those things are building to a life, you know, like a home and, you know, what, what are, you know, what is your family doing and how are you building that family and how are you building memories, you know? See, this is the thing, it ties into remembrance so much because memories are these beautiful fruits, you know, that you're, that are, you know, becoming ripe, right, with time. And you have to allow the space for that. You, you have to allow the space for those to, to be created. And then also just remember that it matters. It's important. You know, it's, it's still work and it's still valuable. It's still, it has um, a value just in being what it is. And um, I think so it, it can, it's funny because I guess as a rem remembering means you're gonna have to do it again and again and again, which is fascinating just, you know, as humans, we, you have to almost like remember anew each day, this, this powerful insight that your essay shares, which is that, hey, the work is being done, you know? Um, but I wanted to ask a quick question with that. So, so yeah, the building that it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. But I want to ask, do you think like somebody has to have a concrete goal? Um, now, obviously when I think about it in the grand scheme of time, you, you know, it can always change into something that maybe one didn't foresee, or it can always become a goal that maybe they weren't anticipating or that they had kind of forgotten and remembered again. But do you think a concrete goal is helpful for the, is necessary? Like, in order to, do, yeah, I guess I'm just asking, is a goal necessary to do invisible work in a, <laughs> well, now I'm talking about productivity, but like in a, in a way that builds, I guess, if, if, if that mm. makes any sense. That's interesting, right? This is like, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I feel like naturally we, we sort of want a direction, right? Mm -hmm. So, I don't know if I don't know if I'd say I don't know if I'd quite say goal, but I think it's I think it's more the comfort of knowing 
am I working towards what direction rather than rather than a goal? Um, but I, I, a goal is goal is helpful because it kind of feeds along the direction, right? Like if I meet this goal, then I can meet this goal and this goal and this goal. But then sometimes things change, right? And goals change. Um, and then the direction changes. And so that's why I kind of say like, maybe perhaps concrete goal is helpful, but I think the more like the one that you can't, the one that you can't sort of let slide by is the direction. Um, a direction must be chosen. And even, you know, the, the paradox of like maybe not having a concrete goal is that the person will make work towards a concrete goal. <laughs> You know, like it will be like their concrete goal to find a goal to give them some direction. Um, that's the concrete. That's the that's the the paradox part. It's like, um, and even someone that feels like they have no direction is a direction. <laughs> you know, in a very paradoxical way. Yeah, well, I mean, I was gonna say that. Like, it's fascinating because. I mean, I always go back to like, I'm, I'm very fascinated by, you know, we've talked about it, but like this idea that what, you know, and, and this, you, you talked about in the great talk with them, the, the body beliefs um, that is on your anchor page, but basically this idea of like, well, what does our body show us? Okay. Our body shows us that the heart is beating every day. It doesn't skip a beat. I mean, it, it's constantly working and it's invisible to us. We feel it, but we don't see our hearts beating. We it's very it's interesting because I was thinking about like how when uh, leading up to this talk I was thinking about how some of the most essential things to us are invisible air you know water we can't see our own heart beating but it's there and it's sustaining us so it's interesting because I think there's an, almost a goal to sustain and it's weird because that's a now thing but that's also a directional thing right because it does propel you into the future you know because as you're sustained, you also carry on in time, right? So the, it's almost like you can't avoid having a goal. And it, I, mean, I know that maybe yeah. that's too abstract. I don't know. I know that's, but it's, it's you, there's almost a way in which like you are the goal, like your body is, there is a goal already inherent in you. Now it's your decision. If you recognize it, remember it. And then, you know, what, what does your, you know, what do you want to do with, with your body, with your life to, um, sort of continue a manifestation of that goal, if that makes any sense. No, it makes sense Thank because you. if we could, if we can, um, I would say I'd probably argue like most people, most people, the, the most concrete and probably the most uh, universal goal is that most people want a flourishing human existence, right? I think this is, I think that's pretty common, right? A flourishing human existence. Now, how is that achieved? as a question to the individual how will they go about that what direction will they choose to kind of get there those are all questions that we have to deal with every single day <laughs> um, sure. you know how i how do i get a flourishing existence and what is my definition of a flourishing existence um so yeah i mean ultimately we kind of are thrusted into having a goal or not having a goal. i mean well we're thrusted into having a goal at one point or another. Um, even having no goals is a goal, paradoxically. <laughs> you know, so true. You know living yes. like choosing to live yes. with no goals is a goal in itself. Yes. And it's like and, it, it reminds me of what we're talking about meaning, right? Like to not have a meaning is still a meaning. You can't escape it. <laughs> you, yeah. you, can, you you still have a meaning. It's just to not have a meaning. You know, so yeah. it's you always have a meaning. Yeah. Do you think that? Uh, do Do you think that there's something that can help someone remember? better or like like how do you remember to remember i i just feel like that's coming to come coming to mind as a question i think i think at least the very first part you have to do is take into consideration that nothing is sort of nothing is unnecessary right everything yeah. everything has some value yeah. all your experiences have some value the question is how do i make that into i guess you could say like visible visible value <laughs> you know how do i put that into existence um because i remember in my video i talk about you know even pouring a cup of coffee if you really pay attention to it you could write something about it you know you could you can make it into something creative if you if you want to right um now some people might say well like well i'm not a writer well it's like 
you could you could draw how like coffee spills you could draw you could get so creative with just like your daily and mundane activities um that you are working towards something that it kind of boils down to a choice i feel like it it almost seems like it has to be that like it just has to be a choice to say i will remember um so i mean that i think that's what it i mean and i know that might not be seem like i don't know what it seems like but it i think there is a choice a, a, a sense of i'm going to choose to remember mm -hmm. um because you could also choose not to and then that's when i think you get into the the murky waters of what is the point of this or like what am i doing or what you know what am i doing with my life you know what is the, what is this particular season four, you know, why am I not doing this or more or whatever? And I think this is great. Like I, I, I often live in a realm of potentials, potential ideas and all these dreams and it's wonderful, but it's also can be overwhelming because you're like, there's so much I could be doing and I'm not doing. And, oh, you know, I still haven't done this and, you know, and all of that. And I think the nice thing about this remembrance of what you talk about in your essay is there something really, there's something really grounding about that. Like, remember, you're here now in this particular time, in this particular place, and you, you, this is the work that's being done now. And none of it's unnecessary. And none of it is more, you know, it's not like this abstract <laughs> concept of getting more done with X is any more valid or any more real than, and actually that's less real than what you're doing now. That's the weird thing. It's like, it's actually very extraordinarily um, uh, almost more like substantiated to see the work in what you're doing right now. And so I think that's, that's very fascinating. And really, I mean, I just really can't like, I think that point should be like underlined and circled and highlighted. It's like, none of it is unnecessary. You know, mm -hmm. all of it is building, all of it is a part of the tapestry, if you will, you know, and um, of life. And when I think about the coffee too, it's, you know, some people might get really creative with like, you know, I, there are some people who really get into coffee who are like really, mm -hmm. they want to research like pour overs and where the beans are from and like roasting their own beans. And that's even a creative act. I mean, mm -hmm. and why does it, and I think maybe we don't allow ourselves space for that because we think about like, well, what would someone else think? How does this why does it matter? It does, you're, it's not making me money, so why does it matter? Mm -hmm. um, now, I think the, the great thing is, is that the, there's value in money. There's value in just you're, you saying it has value to you, you know? Um, so I think we have to kind of like, I think that's what the beauty of reclaiming the word work is in this, in your essay and in this conversation is because now it's amplified to, to extend to both, you know? And there's more room to allow yourself to just say, I, I delight in like learning more about coffee. And it's interesting because it's almost like if you don't remember, you end up never writing the thing or never doing the painting you've always wanted to be do because you just think, well, I never did it. So I'm never going to, it's almost like this weird self-sabotage or something where you're like, well, I haven't done it yet. Well, it doesn't mean you can't do it today, you know, or tomorrow, you know, why does it, who said you couldn't, you had to stop trying. <laughs> you can, you have, you know, you have like hopefully a long life ahead of you or it, so just it, or if even if you don't, there's still like today, right? And there's and if you don't do it today, you're it's the fact that you have like these seeds for that in your head, or like these like these these embers, if you will, they're still there and they still matter. And you know, it just takes maybe like one like big wind, and now you've got a blazing fire. You know, I just think it's wild because it's you know, again in farming and like doing gardening and stuff. There's just like it's something so micro, you know, so little like a seed that you plant you know, and then you don't see it. And then months later, you've got these gigantic plants that are yielding like these giant watermelons that you can eat and see and hold. And I just think to myself, like, wow, what, an, what a picture, right, of the invisible work. Um, it looked like nothing was happening for months. You know, it looked like nothing was going on. Um, and in fact, what was happening looked very strange. And I think this in pregnancy, like what is going on? Like the woman's body is extending, like it's, this is very, uh, this is strange almost. And yet like it's producing a life, you know, here's a whole new eternal being. Um, so it's, it is very interesting. The idea of you, you can never really be doing nothing. It's only if you choose to see it that way. Right? If you choose to see it as like, it's, you're always working. That's always working towards something. Then um, it redeems it all really. Right. Mm. Yeah, I think our, I call it a factory-like terminology, right? Like production 
you're not producing. Um, and if I'm not producing, I'm not making money, I'm not working. Um, but there seems to be a big conflation, like you talked about, with money and working, right? <clears throat> and, <laughs> and that's why, again, I always go back to that, but like working towards what? Um, because it, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, having no money means you're not working. Um, it could be very well that you um, are working. It's just you're not making money. Um, but also at the same time, I kind of understand why people make this mistake because, you know, not making money, that's what, really, what we should call it, <laughs> not making money causes some anxiety, you know, in our day-to-day our -day lives, right? Um, so, but it doesn't mean that you're not working. Um, and, I, and I guess I wrote this article because I'm just like trying to sort of ease the existential self-sabotaging <laughs> and guilt yeah. that comes over with um, not working. That, this idea of like, there's so much more about tending like the, the language of care and taking care of in a sense that is more uh, viable as this broader sense of work, right? Than simply um, earning money or earning affirmation, right? That's the other way we get work. We, we see work a lot of times is like, does somebody else say good job, well done, you know? Um, and there's a place for that type of type of work there is. But if we, if we reduce it to that, if we reduce it to simply what somebody says, oh, you know, you did a good job basically, then we never really allow ourselves to see the work, um, maybe our own work that we're working on or the work that is gestational. Like it's this, you know, this growing um, that takes time that then is birthed one day, suddenly, you know, all of a sudden. Um, so, and also I think too, it's interesting because these, the reason why I think it's an important discussion and why I really love your essay so much is because if we don't make the realization that if somebody is doing, um, what did you say the term was? Something for money instead of work for money. It's like doing something, oh. for, what's that? Making money. Yeah, making money. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if, if somebody's, simp if they're making money, but they don't know like what it's toward even, if you don't have the invisible work in tandem with that, I think it becomes very suffocating. I think it can become very there's, I mean, I'm not saying it necessarily does, but it can become very deadening or suffocating because you're just like, wh what am I doing this for anyway, exactly? Like, mm -hmm. I, I feel like sometimes some of the people who I see who are, you know, flourishing most, like you said, this is this human goal we have to flourish, are the people who are making money in tandem with bigger goals. Um well, and, and this like larger direction, right? Of like seeing the work even when they're not at their job per se. Mm. Um, well, and I think too, like if you see the value of the invisible work, I wonder, I feel like this would also shatter boredom, honestly. I don't know. I feel like mm. boredom is, it's when it's like what Daniel will say, like it's not having nothing to do. It's not valuing what you have to do, you know, or not, you know, not seeing the value of it, like, well, why? Okay. You know, so I think it, you know, in a sense, um, I think understanding that there's this invisible work, right. That's constantly gathering as we, we use that terminology, you use that terminology in our discussions, but it's, um, it kind of allows you to see like, oh, there's even, it's almost like you, even boredom becomes an opportunity space, right? Like it's that space or time, or I'm not, there's nothing that I want to want to do right now, or like I don't know what to do right now. Um, is an opportunity space to, you know, maybe maybe not do anything per se, right? But you're still doing something in, in like maybe a, a moment of of rest or in reflection, or you know, your mind now has more space. And I, I think sometimes the the ability to allow your mind to think, um, think about things, think about things you want to make or create or write or are thinking through, you give yourself that space. And that's a part of the work, right? Because then you start getting like aha moments sometimes in those, you know, places of, of boredom. Yeah, I think boredom is a really good example because 
it's one of those things that if you have the mentality of um, I, that I need to be doing something, then boredom is unbearable. Um, but the way I look at it is, is boredom kind of affords the, the time space to confront something. And that's very, and that's, and that's very terrifying for a lot of people, <laughs> right? Because it's like, oh my God, like, I don't know what to do with myself. And, but the thing is, it's crazy because it's not really something you wanted, like, or demanded at this point in time. But for some reason, the time availed itself to you. And now you're just sitting there just like, I don't know what to do with myself. And I think that's like the perfect time to confront yourself. Um, which which people don't want to do because it's it's really you know scary so yeah uh because i I think it's really because you have to come to grips with like you know what are you avoiding you have to ask questions like that (laughs) you know like what am i avoiding am i avoiding to you know realize that i'm actually feel lonely am i avoiding the fact that i'm actually in pain right now am i avoiding the fact that you know just so many things that you could be avoiding, but all of a sudden it's like nature, time and space are all like working together to sort of make you confront something that um, you're refusing to confront. And so and that's how I look at it. Um, the 100%. Yeah. Well, maybe we could talk just a little bit really quickly here on like Roca with this like solid um, solidarity and peace is like solitude and peace you know, he talks a lot about that. And you did that great talk on solitude, like loneliness. Um, it's interesting. I feel like the idea, this idea of, um, well, there's there's something very, like maybe we're, we're most aware of like the invisibility of like the invisible work when you are alone almost, right? Because that's often the space or time when you're not really, well, it depends. It depends on, you know, there are a lot of people who might work independently or by themselves doing something, but it, there, there's something about solitude and repose and rest and peace that all kind of go together to be like this very, very much, very much the invisible work of like, like you're saying, facing yourself. Um, uh, so I, I'm, I guess I'm just wondering like this idea, maybe too, of seeing as, as this ability to face yourself I mean, do you think that can transpire? Like, how how does one maybe push through to get to the place of of the solitude and the peace in that? Like, is it is it just one's availability to that? Like, acknowledgement of self in that time? Like, how do you sit with the loneliness to kind of get to solitude mm. in like a positive sense of the word? Mm. Like Rilke's talking about. Um, yeah. Because I think the loneliness is when it kind of like, it, it it's, it's what most people associate with like not, pleasant it's not nice to feel like lonely but Mm -hmm. why why is that really like what what's so wrong like with just well that's the thing I think this kind of for me ties in a lot to like my discussions on invisible work as the body and the heart just beating and like life itself just being being a part this kind of continual goal um that feeds into the other goals of life but it's almost like you just have to let yourself be there taking up taking space and saying and being able to acknowledge that that's good you know that, that's that's worthy that's worthwhile that's worthy of mm-hmm. like attention um mm-hmm. you know that's not something to just come constantly be distracted from or need to be distracted from i don't know i wonder if there's something about like i wouldn't say self-worth but like some sort of ability to acknowledge oneself in that um ability to tr- to move from the loneliness to the solitude in the positive sense where you start to really do this i mean oh my gosh the way roca describes like being fast mm-hmm. after yourself and you know jabron also talks about the longing for your uh, giant self is how he says i am um, i wrote mm-hmm. down the quote earlier but yeah um yeah it's um that's the work that's like this invisible work that seems to be so important to some of the great um some of the great poetic and philosophical minds you know yeah, so <laughs> cultivating the loneliness. I mean, it's funny because Rilke, it almost can seem very harsh when you read one of his, uh, was it Letters to a Young Poet, where he's like, he's like, we're really, we're meant to be alone. We're supposed to be alone. We're lonely creatures, something like that, <laughs> right? It just, it's, it almost sounds so pessimistic. Um, but he's really capitalizing something on there because, 
loneliness is only feared because we're refusing to accept something mm -hmm. um you know and how how does one overcome that well i think it's i i've come to this conclusion with reading gibran and rilke mm -hmm. is that one love can't be possessed right love kind of gives unto itself and sustains through itself right um and gibran really does that now the thing that i've expanded upon is is it the fact that we cause ourselves pain because, you know, I want some love, right? I don't want to feel lonely. I want some love. Now, the thing is, and I kind of looked at self-love like kind of a like weird paradox because it's like if we actually take what Gibran is saying is true, then there is no, there is no real self-love, not actually, um, because you can't possess it. So it's not, it's not your self-love. Um, so then how do you how do you overcome that? How do you realize that? And I think it has to do with the fact that maybe we don't possess this this being, right? This being, which is of course completely mind-blowing to a lot of people. Um, but it's it's crazy because when you actually look at it this way, a lot of the existential anxiety kind of eases over, at least for myself. Because when I realized maybe I don't possess this being, but I have responsibility for this being, it changes this entire tone about how I should sort of handle things. Because I, I, I do think that if I'm in the mindset of I possess this being and I'm lacking something, then I'm trying to possess all the things that I lack, right? Now, if I have a responsibility for this being, then it's just kind of like, well, if they come into my responsibility, then I take care of it and nourish it. And it, when if it's time for it to go, um, then it can go, right? And I think kind of sitting with this, right, realizing this, when you reframe it that way, I'm not going to say it's not easy. It's, it's definitely something that Rilke talks about that is like, it takes a lot of work takes a lot of work but it, but, the, but the thing is it's like that is the most difficult task and it's worthy of doing um and he talks about love this way too like it just takes a lot of work um and so this idea of just you know somehow when you start realizing that i don't possess these things um I think there's an opening that kind of allows for the loneliness to transition into a solitude, right? And it, and it took me a long time to sort of sit with this and dwell with this, but it's one of those things that I, <laughs> I think if you like just acknowledge first that, you know, avoidance doesn't really get us anywhere in the long run. Um, it, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that, we end up causing ourselves even more pain um, than we than we want to. Um, so, kind of accepting the the more you could say pessimistic <laughs> uh, starting point is that I'm alone. I'm alone. Um, yeah. But the, but the thing is, I think there's this idea of gratefulness that's kind of thrown in there, right? If you accept that you're alone, when someone comes in, you'll be like, oh my goodness, like. I'm so happy you're here, you know. Um, I'm going to treat you like a wonderful guest. And then, and then when they leave, right, and then when they leave your life, um, there's, no, there's no remorse because you've accepted also at the same time that you're lonely, right? So it's like, yeah. but it, it completely kind of revamps loneliness again because it, it actually has this aspect of gratitude inside of it because it's like, I'm so happy you're here, but then at the same time, like, if you go, I'm happy for you, you know, if you, if you want to go, you know. It's really about the nourishing. You know, you, you, your goal is to nourish so that people, little beings can thrive in their own way. And your goal can't be like, you know, your son being this or your daughter being that. You know, you can't because they're their own beings. You have no idea what they will be one day or what they want to become. All you can do is nourish them now. And so... That, that's something that I really wanted to quickly mention. But then the other thing too is that um, this idea of the solitude. See, it's, um, 
I think there's something so powerful and doing the work, this hard work that Rilke was talking about, about really taking the time to like be fast after yourself, to really be able to enjoy actually this work of digging into your own soul, really cultivating your own soil, if you will, because it's so, it's such, um, it kind of makes me think of like Taleb, like to be anti-fragile because that way you're not reliant on anyone else, basically like sat satisfying or filling that space. You, you're doing the work of filling it yourself. And like you said, then you can have a immense gratitude for someone stepping into that, your garden and, you know, with their garden, if you will. But then also if they are to depart, if they have to go, um, there's a complete acknowledgement of like, yes, it's lovely that they're there, but there's also the loveliness of your own garden too, that you're, you're building. So there's a real, I think it can help people to be anti-fragile in a sense, you know, and to do that, to do that solitude, solitude work. Um, and, and it, it relates a little bit. I was like, I remember I was talking about how let's tie in all the, the things that we, some of the things we've been talking about lately, but it makes me think of indifference, right? Doesn't, isn't that right? Like where you don't, um, you know, indifference gets a very bad connotation, but if we think about it in terms of this, this attitude, right, where it's, you know, great if you're there, great not, great if not, this idea of, and there's something that can feel just so kind of unloving about that. But at the same time, isn't it like, it's almost, if, if you have this sort of like really heavy dependency on never being alone or never, you know, that it's almost like you're just kind of utilizing other people to satisfy something that's in here that mm -hmm. you need to work on or, or, you know, again, cultivate or dig into. Um, so it makes me think a little bit of that topic, Javier, like mm -hmm. the, the indifference, how that's so important to life and love, because if you're and not, again, the, there's a negative connotation with that word, but really the indifference is to say, it's okay, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. It's okay if, if somebody's there, it's okay if they're not. Um, and it might be harder to do the, the alone work, but if you continue doing it, if you remember its importance, like the remembrance of the invisible work, you will con it, it will get easier when I think. And also I think you will get stronger um, in that. Yeah, so the indifference, I remember. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it does have to do with some inspiration from your guys' uh, video that Friday <laughs> with uh, the disaster formula, right? What yes. was it? Um, formula for disaster. What was the formula? It was if if you did x no if, yeah, if you cared about x you would do y yeah yeah, yeah. If you cared about x you would do y, do y. <laughs> and that is that is pretty damaging to any relationship because it always makes you kind of feel like one either that people owe you or that or the individual literally feels indebted to you um and it kind of like questions their values um and so that, you know, that gets very dangerous. So this idea of indifference, you know, I kind of came up with my own formula after that. It was like, mm -hmm. if you care about X, let X be X, right? Mm -hmm. um, or Y, right? <laughs> or Y, <laughs> or Y. Um, now, now the thing is, um, I think indifference has been kind of had a bad connotation because it, it, it trots the line of, oh, you just don't care, right? Mm -hmm. Someone that's indifferent. But I think someone that's truly indifferent is kind of someone that's like, you know, if they ask you to make a cup of coffee, um, it's kind of like, you know, it would be nice if I could have a cup of coffee, um, you know, tomorrow morning before I go to work. Um, but again, it's, it's one of those things that's like, I would say a person that's truly indifferent but would be like, but if it's not there, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna throw a hassle at it, right? I'm not gonna say like, oh, you didn't love me because it's not there. Right. Exactly. Um, right. You know, it's just kind of like, oh, it would have been nice, but if it's not there, then you know, like, you, you might have had other things come up, right? Like right. anything, anything could have came up. So it's this kind of allowance to i guess appreciate the person for who they are rather than trying to change them yeah yeah 100%. Um, so i think if we look at indifference that way it's kind of like it's not that they don't care because even even if you even if you say that it's not caring you're still you're not being indifferent because 
not caring is definitely putting yourself in a specific direction yes. and a specific way, right? Um, so that means like whatever they do, you'd be like, I don't care. Um, and there's, there's almost like no, no gratitude that can be possibly thrown into there for possibility. So it's like, if you have this indifference, right? If they do, if they do decide to bring you the coffee in the morning, you'd be like, oh, thank you. Like, thank you so much for like doing this to me. Right. So it kind of, it kind of just like reinvigorates, um, to where the point, like any, anything this person does is you're always going to be grateful to it because they didn't have to do it. Yeah, right? They didn't have to do it. Yeah. And, and you also realize that you don't own this person yeah. and you don't possess this person. So, yes. um, you know, <laughs> I kind of want to re kind of re uh, evaluate this whole idea of like filling, filling a hole. Right. Mm -hmm. Like you, you hear people say like, Oh, I have this hole and I just want it filled. I think the mistake in this is that, we're assuming that it needs to be filled, right? Um, and I'm, the, the example that I'm thinking about is like, just imagine like a house with an open door, right? Um, a house with a door is, is supposed to be something that allows things to thrive in there and then also allow it to exit when it pleases, right? So this whole idea of like having a hole, I think, I think we, if, if we accept and acknowledge that all our desires are kind of like holes in the holes in the body, <laughs> um, but they actually don't need to be filled. They're actually what makes us. Um, I don't. I, I don't really know how to say it, but it's like makes us just cherishing guardians. You could say like really welcoming guests for things that come in, things that uh, go. Um, so I think that's why solitude and loneliness are so crucial because it really kind of forces you to build your house within yourself, right? Yes. Build your house. Yes. Have, your, um, have your spaces. Yeah, have your spaces, yeah. Um, so, I, you know, that's, that was something that definitely came to mind in our conversation. I was like, wow, like now that I think about it, when people talk about like, oh, I just have this hole inside of me and I just want, you know, I'm just trying to fill it. Um, the, the assumption is that, you know, maybe, maybe it can't be filled, right? And you definitely come to this conclusion. Um, so it's like the real question is, what do you do with it? Well, the question, well, you let it be. <laughs> you let it be what it is. Um, you allow things to enter and you allow things to go. Right. Well, well, that's the thing. It's actually, I feel like in acknowledging that you can't fill it the way you because there's always like this very prescribed possessed concept of what should fill that hole. And really it's when you accept, when you accept that you can't do that, you, you won't be able to find that in the way you want to, then it can be filled. It's so wild Then it can be filled by many different things, experiences, moments, um, dreams, you know? So I think that that's such an important part. And, you know, the indifference, I just think like really quick, I just think it ties back so much to me for the invisible work concept, because, you know, this idea of like, okay, if there's, if there's coffee there, great. If there's not coffee there, great. And it's like with the work, if the visible work is there, great. If it's not there, great. There's still something building because those two people have a relationship. They're always in it. There's no way to be out of it. So it's, if those, if you're talking about this in the dynamic of a relationship, it's the people have that there's, it's like work, you have it, it's there. It's just, it's what, you know, sometimes it's going to manifest. Sometimes it's, it's not in, and often it's, it's more so that it's not manifesting in a particular way you think it should manifest or will manifest. Mm -hmm. It will manifest. It's just going, it might not look the way you think it will look or should look. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's not there. Um, and I think mm -hmm. when we start to have like more of a, a more amplified understanding, we can see much more actually of these beautiful and varied manifestations or not, but they're still there in a way. So you still see it. Um, so I, I, I want to bring that. I wanted to bring that up because I think those topics are actually rather related actually. Mm -hmm. And I think if you, it gives, you have to have the space, right? The indifference to, can I value the gathering where nothing has yet been put in the basket per se, as much as I do when the basket's overflowing, like, can I value mm -hmm. both just as much as one, as one another? And I think that's when you start to get the you know, you're not so dependent on that. That's the anti-fragility of Taleb. Like you're not so bent. You don't, 
need it so desperately because you realize, well, it's already there, whether it's actually the basket's empty or if it's full, you know? Yeah, it's uh, the expectations is something. And I, 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 it goes back to that same possession mindset. Like if you yeah. possess something, you expect it to function in a certain way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, just to give like a more personal story. Um, so my father, right? I could argue he wasn't a good father, right? Now, what's interesting is that when I decided to stop looking at my father like a father and started looking at him like a, just an individual person, um, and I stripped him of all those kind of like expectations of like fatherhood, you know, it actually changed completely um, our relationship and how, how things should uh, move forward. Uh, so, you know, it's, and, and I think that's, and I, I think those, those are one of those aspects of where indifference can work. It's like, it's like, yeah, so maybe my father isn't the best father in terms of father expectations, like what you see, but when you strip him of all those qualities, him as an individual, there's no problems, right? There's really no problems as, as an individual. Um, so it's like, I stopped expecting, like, as a son, I stopped. And once you rid yourself of that, it's so, oh, man, it's so, like, alleviating once you do that, right? Because there's no, like, like, owing. Like, oh, you owe me because you weren't here. Oh, because you owe me because, you know. Um, and so it, ch it completely changes. Um, and, and now you can have a relationship to flourish with. Um, and I think, I think even sometimes, even the idea of, like, having a wife, can because see like we already the way that the way our language already says it right like having a wife like yes i have a wife right like that is troublesome already in the mind because it's like i believe that i now possess my wife right because i have her i have my wife and i have my children mm -hmm. um the thing is like when you have something do you really allow it allow its individuality to exist, right? Um, it's kind of like the same thing with like, if you, you know, <laughs> when you, if you have a bird, but you're like clutching its, you know, little feet, you know, are you really allowing it to be, a, <laughs> are you really allowing it to be a bird? At this point, it's really no longer allowed to be a bird because it wants to fly away and do what it wants to do. Um, so I think the language is, I think we get kind of lazy with language and, um, the language kind of has something to do with our thinking as well. Like, you know, if I say I have a wife, then someone starts really believing that I have one. And when it says that I have one, then I have, when it comes with expectations and duties and so on. Um, and I, and I think that's why maybe some people say things like, oh, but you know, before we were dating and now that we're married, things change, you know, all of a sudden things change. I don't know what happened, you know? <laughs> And I wonder, I wonder if that has to do with the the now possession mentality, right? It's like, yeah. you know, we're they were just kind of like boyfriend and girlfriend, and then all of a sudden it's like, now you're my wife, right? So it's like it throws in yeah. those those kind of like values and possession type thinking that it changes the game now. Yeah. And uh, I, I I think I could see now why people would have some kind of traumatic switching with you know going from girlfriend to wife and so on like well you're my wife <laughs> you yeah. yeah so it's, it's so interesting um, I, I was thinking about as you were talking and um thank you for sharing i i think it's very scary though for people to say like well what do you mean like no expectations like well i mean there have to be some parameters like there have to be some things right and um but this is why i think i mean i think i can understand that that kind of existential anxiety in the stripping away of the expectations because you think to yourself, well, like, you know, I, I can understand that. At the same time, I also see how freeing it is when instead of it being about like who your father should be and how he should show that to you and prove it to you, you just allow him to be. And actually that gives more space for him to be somebody meaningful and be present in your life in a more meaningful way, right? Like versus it being this 
um, facade or this kind of prescription or this thing that should just be what it is. And if you open yourself up to like, maybe it could be something different, or maybe it could be something more or less or just varied or whatever it is, then it's just so much more that actually gives the space, right? There's no space in like a you know, there's no space in like a pressed down sticker, you know, it's just like, it's sure it's, it's very easy because it's not dynamic. It's not shifting. It's what you want it to be, but you, it's also not, it's literally pressed down flat on a, on a piece of paper. It's like suffocated. There's no space for anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you like take off that facade, that sticker, and you just allow it to be what it is, there's so much more space for growth and, and for an actual re relationship. But I will say too, I think something that can because obviously like for a husband and wife dynamic, there are certain things that it, it's interesting. It's like, it, there's something important, but it's also not a whole lot actually. It's really just being, there's so much that actually kind of gives the parameter in just being with that other person and remembering, right? That the remembering this invisible work that this is the person that I'm going to be with and we were going to you know make a life together, et cetera. So I guess what I mean to say is like, the, the, the language you use of not the possession, right, but the responsibility is so key because then it does give some parameters. Your father is still your father. You know, he's still probably provided for your family in ways, you know, so it's like there are things in which ways in which I think the responsibility helps, uh, helps us get some sort of sense that there is something that somebody does to make that relationship a relationship. But the thing is, is that it's not it's kind of like the invisible work. It's always there. He's always your father. There's no way to change. You know what I mean? It's just wild. It's like, there's, he is always your father. You are always his son. Now, if we strip away the connotations that those words have though, and like you said, I think this is where the language, lazy, la laziness of language, but not doing like the, you know, we just want like a one and done label and title versus the cultivation of, well, who, you know, who are you as an individual and I as an individual? And yes, we're in this relationship called father, son, but we're also, that might mean a number of things, right? It might, and, and it certainly won't necessarily look like some, you know, poster of it necessarily. It might, it might not. So anyways, I just think that's, that's interesting. And I think tying in the responsibility there gives sort of a good, I want to say like helps to understand how there are some parameters in that you have to be present with each other. For example, if you're going to like do some sort of work of, um, a relationship really just be available I suppose to each other in a sense um, but then again like we said with the solitude if they're not there then you don't take it like oh he doesn't care or you know like they're not they don't want to be with you know we read into things so easily we should read books more than we read into people but we read into it and so that's what sometimes can be result so yeah yeah I think that's why I like talking about responsibility and possession because you know, I could, I could already hear like the counter arguments, like, well, mm -hmm. if I don't possess anything, then what do I do? <laughs> right. Is it this sort of like carefree um, kind of thing? It's like, no, there's, there's definitely a duty. Um, and, and I think that comes with the responsibility. And so when we talk about ch children, it's like, I don't possess my children, but I do have responsibility for their sort of flourishing, you know? Yes. Um, awesome. And I think I think when you look at like relationships and everything, if you look at your partner as like, you know, one, I have a responsibility for my flourishing, but then I also have responsibility for her flourishing, right? right. Because now we're in this relationship together, right? Sure. Um, so I think that kind of avoids the whole uh, conflict of like, if someone were to say, well, what if they're abusing me? We'll see. That, that right there is like, sort of failing responsibility right you're not you're not being responsible for her flourishing um and so on right yeah and actually i think i think abuse actually comes from the idea of thinking that you possess them 100 percent, absolutely so, yeah um so it's like this kind of you know you're gonna you're gonna be there at my every women call yeah and yeah it's I think once we get rid of that mentality and yeah. sort of like, now that I'm in a relationship, you know, I'm responsible for you, for me, for all these kids. <laughs> um, so it's, it changes almost changes the whole dynamic because it's almost like you start to see like the, the scope of like how serious it is instead of like every, everybody being at your needing call. But 
yeah. the, the, the paradox is you ironically receive if your partner also understands that they have responsibility for your flourishing, right? Um, so it's like no one's no one is left. It's kind of like what Gibran says in one of his quotes. It's like um, fill each other's cup, right? But don't drink from one cup, right? And I think that's so perfect is that you guys fill each other's cup, but you guys don't drink from one cup, yeah. Yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah, 100. Oh my gosh, I'm still thinking about so many more connections with <laughs> the spaces and all of that, because space is also another topic that I know we enjoy talking about. But Javier, I'm, I am going to have to go and <laughs> wrap this up, but I so appreciate you and your time. Yeah. Um, okay. I really do hope that everyone will go and check out Javier's um, Medium page, his Instagram, his YouTube channel. Go look at his work. Go read his work. He's an incredible poet, uh, thinker, and I really enjoy talking with him, and I really appreciate your time today. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Javier.